Excellent. So we are designing design from trust. Uh, we're having a little pop up call on Tuesday, October 9th, 2018. And I will read a description of the general topic, which is kind of trust and communication. Uh, how do you prefer to communicate? Which aspects of your approach to communicating build trust and which might erode trust? Uh, how do you balance being reliable with being intrusive or, or perceived as aggressive? How do you compensate how different technologies affect trust? Meaning, you know, uh, the fact that on video conferencing, my camera's up here, but I'm reading some text that's down here, and you can tell that I'm not looking directly into your eyes right now. Uh, and humans have, you know, we, we place a lot of value on eye contact, so that's interesting. How do you compensate for that? Uh, lighting on video calls, or the fact that some people hate video calls, and other people love texting, and some people do this and that. So it's a practical call, but uh, we'll see how we can uh, adapt in all these different ways. And part of it came about because uh, Alisa was describing her communication style. Um, and I don't, do you want to pick it up from there and just sort of take us in? Sure. So um, this was an interesting topic for me because um, I've been described as an aggressive communicator and I have never heard what that meant before. Um, but it, it came up because when I receive some form of a communication, whether it be a call, a text, um, utilizing Cisco Spark or Slack or whatever mode of communication you may be using, I find the need to respond um, just because it's some, you know, it's the right thing to do in my mind. And when I think of people, when I um, something reminds me of them, I also like to share it. So I decide which method of communication to use to share that experience with them because they're not there with me at that moment. So um, this topic came up because I was trying to figure out how in fact does communication impact one's trust, whether it be together or what you're perceived to have. Um, and so Jerry, I'll send that back over to you, but, but that's where it started. Um, it's, it's interesting because there's so many subtle things about communication, you know, timing being a, a really big one, uh, tone, approach, all those kinds of things. And also people have different preferences, different perceptions, different contexts at the moment. So all of this is kind of very soft, right? It's all, it's all you know, how does it, how does it kind of work? I, I, just uh, as an aside, I just pasted a link <clears throat> into our chat of a page I put up some time ago. Uh, when I started doing more video calls, I put up a page that basically um, offers advice to people on video conferencing. And basically, do not sit in front of a window or a bright light, uh, get some light on your face, uh, leave only like an inch or, or less over your head. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people are on video calls like this. <laughs> and, and it's like, it's a disaster, right? So, so leave very, treat it like a portrait. And when you're doing human portraiture, you leave like a little, little tiny gap above your, above your head kind of thing, stuff like that. And then try to get some good audio because <clears throat> echoes kill, et cetera. Um, and then there were a bunch of articles online about this. So I'm gonna actually post a, a brain link to it as well because anybody who's interested can go follow these <clears throat> links for, for different kinds of advice. Um, but I'm interested in like, you said that some, somebody perceived you as an aggressive communicator. Do you know what they meant or do you know which part of what you're doing they were pointing to? So uh, I treat the way I'd like to be treated, I guess. And so I guess that also goes to I communicate the way I'd like to be communicated with. Um, and so I like to continue to have conversations. Um, and so what's interesting is that is different when you in your work life versus your personal life. Um, versus whatever other type of life um, we might be talking about. And I guess until recently, personally, I didn't understand why it needs to be different. To be honest, I, I still don't. I, I would probably add to that. But I, by receiving that feedback, it helped me understand that if I'd like to continue to communicate um, with different types of individuals, I do have to make sure that I'm thinking about that, right? And, and so it's it, it's still me. Um, it's still I'm still going to act the way that um, I would like to be perceived. But uh, it was definitely interesting, insightful feedback that I've never received before, and this was very recent. So 
it was fresh on my mind. And so I, I thought it would be a great topic to bring up with you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And you, like, I think one of your attributes is you're extremely responsive. Like you receive a message, you reply <clears throat> um, very quickly. Um, and also you're, I, I think maybe, uh, maybe the thing that characterizes that, that came out of our conversation earlier or more is about follow-up. Like you, you right. meet somebody and something gets said or something happens and you're on it and you, you get back to them uh, about the thing. And it turns out, it turns out, I think one of your, one of your pieces of sage, sage advice is that, hey, if you just sort of follow up regularly and consistently, magical things open up, like, like good things happen just through follow up, right? Right. Yeah, and that's, that's a really interesting um, observation that you have because once again, this is all very fresh for me, but until recently, I didn't realize that that was a skill set uh, because once again, I like to treat the way I'd like to be treated. So it, you know, I expect individuals, if they say they're gonna do something, just do it, right? Or, or don't say it. It's not a big deal. If, if we can't commit to certain courses of action, let's just not speak to them because uh, I, I will take them literal, um, especially if there's context prior. And, and so to your point, yes, uh, that's part of my communication. Uh, and it's really helped me in, I would say, personally and in my career. Uh, it's definitely been a huge driver, I would say, to um, the wonderful relationships that I've been able to build. But what's interesting is it can also break trust if, if we don't follow it. And I've seen that happen also. And, then, and I'd say more personally how I feel when uh, someone does not follow through, when they do make a reference that this is what I'm going to accomplish and then they never actually do it or they say they will and then there's no time frame. So then I find myself waiting and it's, it's part of my to-do list. And it's like, when am I going to be able to accomplish this? Because I want to get it done um, mm -hmm. and I want to follow up to it, but I'm waiting on this other, you know, on this other, whatever it might be piece. And, and it's not there. In, uh, in David Allen's language, it's an open loop in your head, <clears throat> right. right? He's the getting things done guy. And, and it creates this open loop that's just sitting there going like, all right, all right, somewhere, sometime, we got to close this loop. All right, come on, help me close this loop, damn it. Sit in the back of my head. And, uh, you know, unless you're like David Allen and you can get it into your system that will remind you of it later on a time, you know, on a, on a timed basis, et cetera, et cetera. Part, part of what he's trying to do, maybe, is control or manage or compensate for, in some cases, the fact that these, these many different kinds of communications are just lying out there because... Because in many of our roles these days, we are holding a ton of communications with a ton of different parties, right? right? I mean, the, the variety, one of the things I can't stand about modern communications is every now and then, I don't remember if the thing that was important that was agreed to is lying somewhere buried in a LinkedIn message thread, which I can't stand, or if we did it on WhatsApp or so, you know, it's like on Facebook, God forbid, you know, Facebook Messenger. And, and <clears throat> for me, the email bin, unfortunately, is, and this is maybe what makes me old school, the email bin is still the thing I look for first when I'm trying to figure out what got said, what did we, you know, what, what did we agree to do, that kind of thing. But now these messages are just strewn everywhere. Yeah. And <clears throat> go ahead, Debs. Yeah, I was just going to say that, oh my God, I really sound bad. <laughs> That's all right, you have a good croak. A good croak, yeah. It's just, you're the first people I'm speaking to this morning, so. Um, what you're reminding me of also is something that like I used to talk about on our old podcast, which is what you, it, I feel like another issue around trust is that we have so many channels and I don't know what your, your, whoever I'm communicating with preference is. So when you're trying to, so flipping it around, when you're trying to communicate with someone or start a thread, you're like, do I start here, 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 here? And if you don't get back to me over here, does that mean because that's just not your preferred channel? And where trust comes into it, or is it because you're ignoring me? Or is it because, uh, you know, and so that's where the breakdown of trust also happens. We have so many communications and so many channels and people um, may just may not have seen it, right? And, you can, and the breakdown of trust can be that you think that they've seen it and they haven't. Right. So, you know, it used to be we just had email and phone. So you kind of knew and then you keep adding these additional layers, which keeps adding opportunities to break down trust. Right. Mm -hmm. And or and or behaviors around each one. Like I have a brother who 
is very old school and sort of treats email like memos. <laughs> so therefore, if we've sent him an email and he's read it, okay. Doesn't understand the concept of replying and saying, okay, yes. Got it, thumbs up. Got it, thumbs up. He's like, well, well why do I need to, we've had conversations about it. Huh. Do I need to do that? I, I've read it and there's no action item for me on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know you, friend. Like, it's just a very different, and there's so many layers around this, in, in, and that's why I love this topic, so, yeah. Um, I have a friend that um, used to use a BlackBerry back in the day and still has like a BlackBerry mentality in a sense. So I know never to send more than one topic per email because, because whenever I did like three bullet items, each of which was a slightly different thing, the first one would get replied to instantaneously, like instant, and, and it was as if the other bullets did not exist. And I'm like, what, what failed here? What broke? How did that go wrong? And it, and it was just, and it was their personal style. Like they were extremely responsive. They were completely on top of it, but somehow weren't reading deep, weren't going you know, through the whole message. Did anybody else encounter that? You know, what you reminded me is, so I have an Android and I have friends that have iPhones. And so when they're communicating with me and send me some sort of emojis or whatever, you know, whatever that form of emotion is, I don't get the same one. Yeah. So I've had instances where that's like an envelope or, and at first I didn't realize it's because I don't actually get, you know, it's, it's a different system. That's so a great point. example. Yeah, to your point, you're absolutely right. I, I feel like I'm missing parts of a communication and parts of that emotional piece to it because I don't see it. I don't understand what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, so it's a really funny concept. And uh, what you also reminded me of is I've always felt like my struggle I'm, is prioritization. Like, to your point, I have a lot of things going on. So I, I feel pretty comfortable with my organization, but not always with Am I prioritizing the right pieces in the time that I have during the day? But what, you, what I'm finding through this conversation is there also should be a prioritization of methods of communication because oh, yeah. there are so many methods of communication. So, you know, t are we prioritizing the right ones and, and do we know which ones to prioritize based on the individuals that we're speaking to because they might have a different yeah. prioritization. Right, that, and that's the challenge. Yeah. And, that's, and that's not something that we present to one another, meaning <clears throat> I would love it if yeah. your you know, public facing profile said, and by the way, I can't stand texting yes. and I love this and yep. whatever, whatever. And you know, g given, given full choice of media, I'd rather go here than there. I'd love to know that, right? You did a whole show on this on, on Tumble Vision. Seriously, that's Eight cool. Like, well, not yeah. a whole show, but yeah. This is such a hot topic for me. Matter of fact, I just had lunch with Clive Thompson in New York. Huh. And we were talking about this and he's like, well, you, you know, you should write it up. So like, and you know, my approach is less like Jerry's sort of design. We need to design from trust, which is a great way. It's just this observational thing. Cause I'm out networking now looking for my next chapter and you, you either feel like a stalker or, you know, like, here's another great example. If you have an, um, if your primary mode of communication <clears throat> with someone in more of a social context, you know, Instagram, and right. that's the only relationship that connection you have, even though you've done work together, it just feels like a weird crossing of a wrong chasm to like bring, you know, one thing into the other thing. It's kind of the old um, etiquette about you don't talk about work at a cocktail party. So it's just... We're doing this across channels in ways, in much more subtle ways. And the etiquette is changing. Completely. The etiquette is shifting in, in interesting ways, although we're still kind of humans who communicate like humans, but the, the etiquette is shifting a lot. I just put a link to, in our chat, <clears throat> a couple people, not many that I know of, have written uh, what, what they call personal user manuals. Um, and basically it's how to deal with me. So, so Brad Feld published uh, the one that I just sent the link to, and he talks about like, uh, what are your quirks? What drives you nuts? What qualities do you particularly value in people who work with you? What is the best way to communicate with you? What is the best way to convince you to do something is, is one of the things he addresses. I love it. And, and it's really interesting. And, I, and when Deb and I first met, I was a tech industry analyst, and I, I began to notice when PR firms had prepped their clients coming in to visit me to pitch me, really well because you could tell they were like he likes community he you know wants a little warm-up conversation beforehand to get to know you whatever whatever but, but you could sort of tell when the prep was really good and i i, I really yeah. appreciate that i mean yeah yeah instance it's just it's a very deep 
topic and the fact that you're making it, it would be great if individuals, you know, made it obvious, but it's also just the, all the ways that we are not building, like I said, we, we did a lot of these conversations on Tumble Vision. It was less, it was, you know, all the ways that we're not paying attention to the signals that need to be addressed in the tools that we're designing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the tool designers don't seem to be that clever about a lot of this stuff. Like yeah. somebody, somebody's not talking enough to the tool designers <clears throat> about some of these subtleties. Right. Sorry, Lisa, it looked like you were gonna say something. No, no, I was just also thinking at what point do you start mimicking the way you're communicated? Because I'm actually making an observation to our call today. Some of us didn't have our cameras on, right? Now, some of us did. So at one point we all felt the need to turn them on. And I'm even thinking, Deb, to your point around the Instagram piece, yeah. I just got Instagram and I have so many relationships that prefer Instagram. And it's so odd for me. And I'm starting to find myself communicate more through it too. And sometimes start a conversation there versus through a text, which is actually my preferred method of communication. It's just, it's just so interesting to notice that. Mm -hmm. And to Jerry's point, what happens when you start there? And then it gets, and then you all say, like how many times have you guys said, what well, pick, a, pick a channel, can we move this over? there whatever yes. the there is and then the there gets dropped mm -hmm. or you know some of this i also wonder if it's it's um the instant gratification like not gratification but the instant communication um world that we live in like we're all so we're all very lifo like you know the last thing in you know is like so okay. there's and then again with the, the the layer that i always put on top of it is the, um, the person on the receiving end of the communication and how they perceive it. Like the fact that you were called aggressive, you know, the also is um, reflects, can be reflected by how you're emotionally feeling that day, right? Am I, yes. am I being ignored or is the person just busy? And then we reach a point where if you try to contact that person through 10 different channels, are you a stalker or are you just very passionate? That's right. To get in touch with that. Like I've reached stalk, I've reached what I consider stalker status. So, you know, um, but really the person, you know, a lot of it is timing and catching them. And so there's all these unwritten things we're not talking about. And so, and I, yeah. I completely agree. And I just was watching Jerry, what you posted around cultural aspects. So um, now I'm like thinking about that cultural aspect because I was raised to be very direct. And, and to your point, Dad, maybe that directness is perceived as aggressive. And I have been before perceived as very direct. And, and so it's, it's kind of has a parallel and in this case potentially, but it's just interesting because this is a very new reflection for me versus I started thinking back to, well, all of my personal communications were always talking back and forth, but this was a newer, this was a newer relationship. So did they not perceive it to be that, positive direct piece right. and I remember sharing it with someone that was also a newer contact and they loved it like when I said I'm like well this is something new for me but I was called an aggressive like oh that's amazing and I was like really <laughs> like, so it's just it, it's so interesting how uh you know that perception changes and, and that cultural shift can impact it too and, and also it's not like this didn't exist before right um, it's just that it's just that we have all these additional channels that highlight it more you know um you can be the, the, you know, the direct New York. And also the fact that you're texting versus having emotion, you know, this exists face to face as well, but you lose the, the, um, uh, sorry, I have a pet that's eating my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you lose, you, you come across more directly aggressive in a text without any emotion. Right. And, and then there's the lack of affect in texting and the, the, the ease with which we pick up uh, or infer falsely what's going on and but then there's also imprecise communications. Like when somebody sends me a note that says, let's, let's talk at seven. Ah. Like, Could you just say which time zone and which day? Oh, yeah. right. Just repeat it for me. So I know that we mean what we think we mean. Just yes, exactly. exactly. Over and over and form a tiny bit. So we're, so we're agreed. Which also reminds me of the fact that it, it's changed now, but I've been, I've been in California for 14 years and I have a 917 cell phone. And when I first moved here, I would get phone calls at like 4 a.m., you know, because oh. people did, you know, they, there's assumptions people made about um, um, Your area, code. area codes and things right. like 
that, which doesn't exist as much anymore, but it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. My, my area code is still 415 because that's where I got my phone. And, and, right. and people think I live in Marin because I bought the phone in the store in Marin, right? Oh, that's, it's yeah. like, mm, not so much. So that's a whole different level of, of design issues that, you know, for, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the lack of physicality and what that means. You know? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Blue wanted to say hello to you, Jerry, so I let her come. Thank you, thank you. That was really nice to see her. <laughs> Even on Zoom, you know, I was thinking, move between speaker view and gallery view, and the call feels very different, right? I and mean, I've done so many Zooms at this point, right? And so yep. it ends up feeling more like if you're in speaker view, it's more like, and you know, if I'm speaking now, I'm taking up your whole screen, then I am, you know, in front of a room pontificating. Whereas if we're in Brady Bunch mode, feels more like we're all here together. Yeah. And um, one, one thing I do a lot, I, Zoom is kind of eating my communications, at least this year. This is kind of the year of Zoom, yeah. which is pretty interesting. I was, I was a big fan of Hangouts, but Hangouts kept hiccuping and <clears throat> kept causing problems. And yeah. you weren't quite sure where to send people or what to do. Yeah. So, you, so again, uh, Google not paying that much attention to their communication software because to their to their social communication well with, and, and now deprecating g plus you're just not good at it that's fancy. yeah which is so too bad i mean it's really so too bad i'm an android phone user like elisa is and mm -hmm. the google hangouts app i have to constantly crash it and reboot it because i think okay. i sent a text but it's it hangs at sending i'm like really um doesn't doesn't google think it's an important app uh, no it's not a AdSense link, it's not as important. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it's interesting because we're all four have our videos lit up now. And part of that may be, uh, may be related to the fact that I turned on the recording button. Um, so we may be sort of more aware that in leaving a record, yes. uh, a record of a video call looks a lot better if all the people's faces were present. That, that really does help. Because when you see a video and it's like half, you know, half or more of the faces are just icons, that's very different. So that might have played a tiny role in it. Who knows? But, but, you know, it's hard to pry inside each of our heads and figure out all, all the different micro decisions we're making as we that sort we're of... we're not even aware of. Exactly. Exactly. One, one, thing, um, one thing I wanted to bring up was sort of interruptions and um, both in person and in technology. And uh, interruptions also has this side channel thing because as some of you were talking, I was typing things into the side channel and vice versa. And I'm wondering whether some people perceive a slightly different topic pursued on the side channel on the chat as being an interruption. Like, hey, I'm talking about whatever attention should be on my topic, but when I do it on the sideband, I'm trying to offer some color commentary on who just spoke. Yo, Dave. Um, I'm trying to sort of, you know, offer some something we should talk about in the future of this conversation or whatever uh, as we go forward. Uh, Dave, we're talking about trust in communications. Uh, I think you, if you if you saw the the email I sent, it's kind of that topic. And Great. And I actually dropped into the wrong call, so I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna drop off and I may try to come back. But oh, okay, sorry. sounds great. Good to see you though. Then <laughs> <laughs> um, there's that. Right? Then there's that exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but on interruptions, there's the huge gender issue of men interrupting women all the time. Uh, then there's just some people just tend to interrupt, like male or female. They just have a, they, they, they're, they know what they, they know how to complete the other person's sentence. And so they're just going to do that, right? <laughs> I just get concerned, I'll forget. You know, yeah. like, I'm like, if I don't say it right now, or if I don't write it down, I'm not going to remember what I was about to say. And I really want this person to hear it, right? Because I'm emotionally invested in this conversation. So, sure. yeah. On that note, I had this thing where, and you've probably heard this, Jerry, I've given an Ignite talk comparing both coasts. And one of the things I've always said was interruption in New York is a sign of passionate agreement. Mm. And on the West Coast, I mean, it's overly cliche, right? Like you could say Tokyo versus Israel. And in other cultures, it's rude. Like, what, and that's what you're saying, Lisa. like, I'm jumping in because yes, 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 yes. And I've had to learn, I know in this group, I don't have to as much, but to really temper that um, and to, perceive, to even perceive what, what I'm doing to others. And that breaks completely if we're not all, you know, 
the 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 not what why am I forgetting this word in my senior moment the nonverbal communication that yes. Kevin and I <clears throat> talked about there's a word for it it's the nodding it's I've given I, I'll, yeah I know I, the affect the no, no, there's another word no um, I will pull up a thing and I'll find it all right all right that's the stuff we miss when we don't all have the video on or we have a mixed version of it you know. So my adaptation, my adaptation to the interruption problem, because I know that I probably used to interrupt a lot more than I probably still do, and I'm sure I still do, um, but my adaptation has been, when I used to take notes on paper, I always used to have a little square ruled pad in front of me. On the right margin, on the right side of it, would be the things that I wanted to bring into the conversation. I would just keep a list. And, and when people say stuff, it triggers a lot of things for me. So I write them all down. And in some cases, let's say it's a briefing from a little tech company or whatever, a startup, mm -hmm. um, I could probably go through the whole list and I would go through it really quickly. And then I would say, which of these is interesting to you? I'll tell you more. Um, in some cases, you look back on the list and you realize, shouldn't, you know, don't need to add any of these things because not appropriate or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now I take notes generally in Evernote. That's my sort of note taker during meetings. Mm -hmm. And so for most calls, I'll have a note taking portion and then under it, I'll have me colon, and then under that, I'll have things that I want to mention in the conversation. And then really often at the end of the conversation, what I do is I copy paste the me into an email and that's my follow up. So, I, you know, gosh, I want to mention this article by Stephen Berlin Johnson. And so then I, I, I mentioned it in, in, in the conversation, but then I want to send the link afterwards. So it kind of makes that a little bit, a little bit easier for me. And this goes back a little bit, Elisa, to follow ups and how that works. And I'm not, I'm not the best follower upper. I'm not the best executor on everything. It's one of the things I always have to work on for me in particular, because I'm involved in too many things at the same time. And I have two arms, not eight, which is a, a regret I have. I should have been born an octopus. Um, or cloned. Or cloned. Cloned would be fine. <laughs> cloned would be fine. I mean, if, 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 they're, if they're willing to take direction, I mean, if they, if they try to take over, if there's like a palace coup and, and, and prime number four decides that it wants to be in charge, then I'm in trouble. Have any of you taken a, like the strengths finder, Myers-Briggs, Gallup studies, just to hear? So during this conversation, I was looking at Jack and Jack, my second, um, so my first is competition and my second is actually um, includer. So I'm looking at our call and I'm in the Brady Bunch mode and I'm like, everyone's talking, but Jack's not. So we need to, get, you know, it, so it's so funny too, because in my mind, that's also part of a conversation is is everyone getting what they want from it? And, and, I, and I get concerned. I get concerned if everyone is involved because I, I want them, they choose you know, to be part of a conversation. And so it, it's just so interesting. But then I realize that somebody else's strength you know, might be that like empathy or, or they just, they, they take longer to process. So they actually prefer to be silent because they're listening and then they'll be typing it in. So it's just, that's also a part of communication to be aware of is how do we prefer to communicate and process? I totally agreed. <clears throat> and then Jack just did the jazz hands, which, um, <clears throat> which I, I teach people, I, whenever I give a speech in front of an audience, I teach them jazz hands. And I love, it has a little contagion, contagious effect, which I love. But I find, I find jazz hands to be very useful on Zoom, in particular in Brady Bunch mode. Forget it if you have, if you have only one speaker at a time. But if you're in Brady Bunch mode, this <clears throat> gives a lot of color to the conversation, especially when three, four, five, six or more people start picking it up and doing it. And it makes it much livelier than just a whole bunch of people like this and one person you know, who has the floor. Um, and then second note, uh, one is skilled in a live meeting is the interjection, is waiting for the breath, waiting for the pause, trying not to run over what somebody's saying, but stepping in to, to either add color or change, shift the conversation back on topic or call somebody else into it or, or, or. That's one of my skills live. I find that superpower completely debilitated online. I, I think I might be getting a little better at it, but I find that the, 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 the minute lag period and the, a couple other things about video nuke that nuke that power somehow. So I, I wind up, I wind up using the sideband a bunch more, et cetera. Well, you just raised something that I forgot about because we all have no lag time here. Yeah, you know, we've all been on the calls where that one person is not connected well. You know, video calls. And it right. changes the whole nature of, right? You know, and it's sort of like that, you know, I always try to bring all these, these samples back to like what it's like 
if we were all in the same room. And it'd be comparing it to a person who like, you know, jumps in 30 seconds after we've moved on to another topic. <laughs> what did I miss? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, and that's hard. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, Jerry, you're so good at that in real. So what I would, I'm curious, cause you are, it's your superpower. It, you know, being in a room with like as many as, I've seen you do it with over a hundred people, you know, really understanding and being present. I'm curious, what, what, what are some of the things, like, cause I'm sure you've thought about it, mm-hmm. make this a challenge for you. Cause here we're only four people, right? Let's mm-hmm. say, you know, can you tease out what, I'm sure you've thought about it, what it is? Mm-hmm. Um, because that's really, whatever it is, 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 is the design piece that needs to be thought about, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, in a room, like face-to-face, part of it is um, having good peripheral attention. Yeah. So a, a lot of people, like a terrible waiter is the one who just stopped at the next table and didn't see you going, Right. Right. So, so I kind of have an auctioneer's attention when I'm in the room in front of a lot of people, which means I'm processing a whole lot of input. I misinterpret a couple of things like, Oh, was that a comment? No, you're just scratching your head. Okay, fine. Right. Um, and, and, and paying attention to the periphery pays off really well. Cause I can tell when somebody's like kind of pissed off about what's being said. And then I'm in the background, I'm busy processing. Okay. Do I invite them in? You know, Hey Dave, you look like you're a little pissed by what's being said. Do you, do you want to jump in? Uh, it helps in settings like Jerry's retreats, where I know everybody in the room because the ability to call in people by name is magical. It really it really changes things. Right. And I also I know a lot about it. Yeah. yeah, and I know a lot about most everybody in the room, so I know issues that they're that are really hot for them. I know maybe. Uh, events that just happen in their lives, and now through Facebook, because we all kind of publish our lives so much. Everybody has a lot of read on those kinds of things. It's, it's you know, pretty interesting how that works. So then um, in Zoom, the max yeah, I get- people Most people don't connect those dots. That's what I wanted to say. Like that's a really interesting piece. Yeah. Connecting those dots in different contexts. Is really- I'm, I'm paying attention to a bunch of different things in, when I'm running a room. And, and I'm doing the same thing with my little notepad because in a room I definitely have my little square ruled you know, pad in front of me. And I'm keeping a cue of who wants attention next for, for, to speak next, but I'm also keeping a, a, a bit of a cue of topics that might be interesting to go to next or that might fit where we are. And, and, and I can't keep that all in my head. It's, it's it, like the cue, I, I, I pop a fuse if I try to hold that all in my head, which is why the pad is so important. Um, but, I'm, but I'm paying attention to a lot of different things, right? Um, and which, the, the, the lens, the, the, the nature of the yeah. 2D nature of the lens sort of like. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because you and I both did like podcasts for a decade when podcasts, before podcasts were cool. Right. Um, and we, we, uh, made them cool. We, we started. Them. Thank you. I like, I like to think that as well. Oh, and, and early in my podcast, in the Yitan podcast, Pip, right. my, co, my co-starter said, hey, why don't you do like a summary at the end? Right. And, and Deb, you remember, Jack, you may remember um, I, at the end of each of our podcasts, I would do a summary of today. We talked about this, this, this. And I could do that because I was taking copious notes on paper while hosting the conversation, while looking at the chat, <clears throat> while, you know, the, the whole thing, while managing, like, did we lose people? You know, tech support. I was tech support, the whole thing. It, it was insane. <clears throat> you were so good at it because they were tight calls. And, 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 very- and I love doing the summaries. And some people love the summaries more than the calls. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but I say all of that because at one point later I trained somebody on how to, how to host podcasts mm-hmm. and we, we did some, we did a one or two training sessions. Then we had the first call and, and I noticed that she ended the call kind of early and then we debriefed afterward and she said, Jerry, I looked down at my notes toward the end of the call and I had not written down a single thing. <laughs> and that, that's the point at which I realized <clears throat> that very likely not everybody's doing all the processing I'm doing at the same time. And that, and that I don't know if it's trainable, but I think the multitasking versus single tasking thing isn't a, a, a character definer, but I think some people find it really, really hard to attend to many things at once. I totally get that. <clears throat> but different types of things. Yeah. I can yeah. multitask different things than that. And we had three people on our podcast and I can tell you how that broke down, but keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and, and for instance, uh, my wife, April, it took me a while to get her to understand that her calendar memory, 
her feats of, of like a daring on being able to recall things and dates and all that was not a normal attribute. It was a superpower. Yeah. And, and therefore that my inability to remember dates at that precision uh, was, not, was not a definite character flaw. But and it rather, didn't I was, mean that you didn't love the event or it, it wasn't right. right. It, just, it just meant I was further toward the mean of the curve. I wasn't like def, def, deficient on the skill. But you remember that it was Wednesday of May. Doesn't mean that I didn't love the event. And I'm not sure what year we were in Mongolia. I really, I'm <laughs> sorry, but I don't know what year we actually flew to Mongolia. I couldn't tell you right now. I know about that too. I can give you a range. I'm probably good within like three years. Right. Wow, that is a super, that is a superpower because I suck oh. at so, so one day a couple of years ago, she turns to me and it's not like the 4th of July or whatever. She says, you know, I'm going to scare you right now, but I can tell you what we were doing on this day for the last seven years. Isn't that a, isn't that a actual, um, like th there's a name for this. Like there, I think so. I, there, it, I've seen interviews with people who can do this. It's like people who can do mental math, you know. Yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's a thing. It has it's a, a thing. It's a it's thing. A so, so. So wow, that's insane. I'm jealous. It is. It's fun. So partly, how do we make some of these superpowers a little bit more explicit so we can share the wealth and help one another with the superpowers, either to bring your own superpowers into somebody else's event or not, or to show other people, teach other people, coach other people in using the superpowers. I think that's interesting. I'm just, I think we need a new digital Myers-Briggs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I, I collect up personality profiles. I'll put the link to my brain uh, for it in our chat. Uh, yeah. there, are, there are a shocking number of personality profiles. Yeah. This, this is a very enjoyable call for me because I literally was planned. I haven't been writing a lot lately, as Jerry knows, in a really long time. And this lunch I had with Clive, which was all about this topic from a different entry point. And he's like, Deb, you should write it up again. Just, just write a Medium post, get out of your system. So this is giving me a lot of food for thought because I talked about this like, Jerry, you and I have circled around this topic for years and I just love that you're approaching it from the design perspective because I think the time is now right. um, that enough people, sort of like the same issues around privacy, mm -hmm. enough people <clears throat> are dealing with these issues in multiple ways that I think it would resonate. It, it should, and it's starting to resonate in the industry in the sense that you're getting anthropologists and you're getting people. And I think we need to have Elizabeth on the next call. <clears throat> Churchill? Yeah, because she deals with this. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. That'd be but great. I also, I also wonder if like awareness heightens it, right? So um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Jerry, for example, with April, as soon as you made her aware that that's her superpower, right. did, she, like, did she perfect it even more? Did she sharpen it more because of that? You know, and so that's an interesting piece, <laughs> right? Like, it's like, yeah. well, let me, let me, let, you know, that's, that's a, a brain power for me. So let me go ahead and train it, you know, like, I mean, let's, let's go ahead and, and see. And, and maybe I would be curious if you asked her again, like once you made her aware, did she make a point to start testing herself to see if it really is something that's her superpower? And, and, and is that one of the reasons why it became even stronger? Yeah. Because it's, I mean, it's, it's. it's I, I can, I can totally ask. Yeah, I will ask. Because I think about, you know, I'm thinking about my own at this point, you know, and I'm like, well, as when people make me aware, I definitely am more cognizant of them. And then I start thinking about them during my conversations. And I, I do sincerely believe that maybe it's that like accountability at this point, because every, you know, I'm made aware of it, but uh, I do feel like it's becoming stronger. Totally. I'm, uh, I'm actually, I just sent the message. I just sent the question to April over, uh, over chat. So we'll see if she, <laughs> if she answers. I figured, I figured I can ask her later or I could use a sideband right now. Right, right. Um, Alisa, the, this, this topic started between us and, and like we've, sure. we've picked around a bunch of different sides of it. Are we close to where you were, uh, where you were thinking? What are we missing? Where, what should we uh, push on a little harder? You know, I, I think we've covered so much and we've taken it in so many different ways than I even thought of. So I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation. Um, when I think about what I'm personally trying to figure out, I, I think it's how to earlier on determine, um, and whether that be that user manual that was typed in earlier, but like how to determine what is the best mo method of communication, how to determine how to build that trust sooner 
um, with your prospective audience, just because, I mean, that's, that's the point of this conversation, right? The point of the conversation is to have a trustworthy and, and relationship building conversation. So um, I know you typed an AI there. I think that's a great point. And I actually, during the course of this call, because of the whole um, the camera piece, I started noticing it. And I was wondering like, is there a capability where my camera can follow my eyes so that you can see that I'm actually watching you um, because I am interested, I am engaged, and I want to make sure that, that my audience knows that. Um, so Elise and I met through an exponential change uh, project at the company she's been working at. And was it one of, the, one of the teams, I don't think it was your project, one of the teams had an AI assistant for video conferencing, didn't they? I thought that was There was, one of, yep. Yeah. And, and there, there's actually been, somebody did a doctoral thesis on this that I saw at a conference a couple years ago. And the idea is um, you could have some pattern recognition looking at the conversation. And uh, the, the one that I saw uh, is called Us Plus. And what it does is it's measuring uh, who has the most, who takes how, how much time during the call. So if you are eating the whole conversation, it'll, it'll send you a side note that says, hey, it looks like you're talking more than everybody else. Uh, it notices p uh, pitch intonation. Uh, if you tend to be monotone, it'll tell you, I think, uh, things like that. And I think it's also trying to read, are you frowning a lot? You know, and, and some people unconsciously frown when they're in uh, their idle behavior. When they think, yeah, yeah. Is that, and they, but they don't, they don't know. Like they have no idea that their idle behavior is like that. And, and one thing I do on, on calls is I'm kind of looking to see, do I look like I'm like grumpy or mad or something? And I, I, I may actually sort of prompt myself to smile a little bit or to, or to move more into the light. It, it's a little bit move like the light, Jerry. Move into the light. What's funny? It's like a moth, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I coach people on public speaking, I'm like, "Do not duck the light. The light is how your audience will see you. You need to be under the light. You need to make sure that you are illuminated by the light. You know, do not avoid the light." And and here uh, here on video, I think very few people think about lighting or understand lighting, but it's really pretty important. And when I started doing my podcast, the best tip we got at the time, because we started on uh, what's his faces. Uh, um, I'm literally, I'm forgetting names. I'm no, I am. I'm bad. I'm bad with names. I'm great with faces and bad with names. So it's just getting worse. It, it's very helpful if you're doing a, a a a call like this. I'm obviously sick today, and I'm literally on the couch, so I can be near the water. Have one light source on the upper right and one light source on the bottom. Like it literally, like you put a. So like a key light and a side light, yeah. Yeah, I'll put a table lamp on the floor doing like, and so then you, I'm lucky because this gives me decent light, but yeah. general, that makes a huge difference. And you have the nice long shot along the wall with a fireplace in the back. It's a very interesting shot, well framed. You know, but by the way, usually it's like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, which won't last for too much longer, Jerry, because I'm going to be moving back to New York. You're going, I was wondering, when do you move? I, I haven't picked a date. We'll talk about it later. Okay, good. By the end of the year, by the end of the year. So. Okay, good. That's funny. Yeah, so I'm going to very much miss this, this home. Yeah, yeah. But, but you'll be in New Yorker again. Change is good. Yeah, yeah. Change is good. Keep saying that to yourself. I am. I am. Because I, it's, you know, ugh. anyway, that's a, for you and I to catch up on. But um, I love this topic. I'm, I'm curious, Jerry, because how many of these calls have you done? And are you doing this kind of like ETAN? Like, this is a topic I love. And I just want to explore this with as many people as I can. Say. So design from trust, this particular topic and group and set of calls is new. This is, uh, you know, the third call <clears throat> in this particular series. And uh, the, mo the reason for the design from trust group is to design design from trust as a practice in the world. So there's kind of a focus around what is it? How does it work? And I'm envisioning, so uh, for instance, there is a design, uh, it, uh, If you go to designfromtrust.com, there's a fledgling website. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a fledgling website there. If you'd like to help build out the website, let me know. I'll, I'll authorize you to, to, to edit you know, the website, et cetera. And I'm envisioning that there would be a section, a subpage on the website for individuals and a subpage a sub on the website for corporations and one maybe for municipalities. I love uh, it. Because, because that's one way to cut this. It's like, are you one of these or one of these or one of these? Um, and that the one on individuals, um, I will certainly point to like here, here's how to build trust while having a video conversation is a really interesting subtopic. Totally. Right? It totally fits. 
Um, and it's also like really good and practical because because very often discussions about trust, this will surprise everybody, um, can get just a wee bit abstract. No. Um, just a little. And and so um, so I'm kind of going with whoever has energy on whatever topic. Right. And uh, as Elise and I were talking last week, this was like, this bubbled up and we're like, well, let, let's make a call out of it. So <laughs> I want to do a lot more of this. So as you think of things, totally. let me know and we pick a time and we do it. And Jack, you know, if you want to, uh, whatever pieces of this make uh, make sense for you or, or jump out for you, let's let's do that as well. So that that's the idea is to to basically see what the group of people who starts showing up here is interested in. Jack, did you want to jump in? Just wanted to say we should talk about that. Um, as you know, I'm out of town next week, but when I get back, I would like uh, like to participate. Sounds great. Sounds excellent. And again, uh, timing is right because I'm looking to start using that part of my brain again. It probably won't be in, um, you know, it has, I just miss it. I miss talking about it and I miss writing about it. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to um, approach it um, this time around in shorter bits and bites rather than thinking about a big thing, whether it be a book or a big podcast or, a, you, know, it, you know, a way to make a living. Like just, just, just want to explore it. So mm -hmm. See what it, where it leads, so yes. Love that. So I have a reply from April. She wrote back, uh, I thought about it more for sure, which I didn't realize. And then she writes, I realized I had something I did not have before. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, um, when, you, when you brought that up, Elisa, I was thinking, it's interesting how different people, if I was told I had a student su superpower, I don't know if I would, it wouldn't prompt me to work on it more. It would prompt me to just be like, huh. I've got this thing, you know, I don't need, you know, not necessarily about honing it, making it better. So it's just interesting how we approach these things. Right? Mm -hmm. After I coached the person on the call and on, the, on how to podcast and take notes and all that, when we ended that, I'm like, oh crap, you know, so this might be a superpower, but I haven't sort of pushed it hard. I haven't, I haven't gone back and done that. So making me think maybe I should. Yeah, that is a big, that, I, I mean, I, I, you have a bunch of different superpowers, but I hadn't thought about it in a really long time. And that Yitan superpower of yours was the one that, that blew my mind the most. Because <laughs> it's not the ability to summarize, it's the ability to both be present, tumble the room, manage the room, and do that. So that's a really interesting, we need to do a brain scan. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Cause, cause I, physical brain, not his digital brain because I, I really enjoyed the whole process i really enjoyed the whole thing it was like the calls were interesting to me i was picking topics that i cared about i got to hone my my hosting skills and my my interviewing skills uh the people who showed up our, our little posse that showed up regularly was really fun and so i got to see you all regularly which was great um i never quite perfected the link over to itunes and made it a good podcast i did zero marketing of it seo of it i was terrible at that um and then the note taking, while a lot of mental work, was not a lot of work. Meaning, for you, for you. <laughs> I, had to be, I, had, I had to be really present. Like if all my neurons weren't on the call, it was not going to go well. But doing that didn't feel like a lot of effort. It was like, oh, okay, here we are, we're, we're, we're in the thick of it. And then doing the recap at the end was happy making, partly because after a while I knew this is really the fun part. And also while taking notes, over time, I learned that I would make big circles on the page for the, 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 the things to mention on the recap, right? So here's a cluster, here's a cluster, here's a cluster. So that then as I did my recap, I would just be, you know, I would, I would have visual cues on my note pages. But um, at the end, we were doing 90 minute calls. It started as 45 minute calls. It turned into 90 minute calls toward the end of UTAN. And I would have six, seven written pages of notes at the end of a call easily. So yeah. my, my thing that's amazing about that is when I did a podcast, guys, it was, it was three of us. And we hadn't thought about it at the time, but we, we definitely each had different roles and personalities. But one of my cohorts was, and, and what we, our podcast, now you can do this so much easier, but we couldn't, we had a live chat during the podcast. So it was really the kind of podcast that you wanted. To, I, mean, I don't know how many listens we had after the fact. It was really more like a Yitan call. It was more like, um, you know, we did a podcast and we had this live chat during, during it and we could never integrate those two. So it was really like joining a call, joining a call like this. Mm -hmm. um, and during the whole thing, we, we always joked, I call Kevin Marks the link whisperer because we would mention something and within two seconds, he'd have a link to it. 
You know, like he literally would find 10 different, he's like the living Wikipedia, mm -hmm. you know, and it was an amazing superpower of his that he doesn't, like when you, certain times when you have a superpower like April, you don't understand. It's that, like Pete Kaminsky. Right. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is say Pete Kaminsky. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, they're very similar, the two of them. Very, very similar. And yeah. but imagine doing like doing this live. It would be like, oh, that's boop, 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 boop. Now we weren't able to translate that to great post show notes because of who we, we just didn't. But that's a super duper um, helpful skill. And, mm -hmm. and I think you could probably, you know, if you wanted to go back to the, um, the woman you were giving the notes on podcasting about, like you just said, like you'd circle things. Why I'm sure there are things you do that you could break down and make, mm -hmm. and, and clickbait the SEO of design from trust these days better than we have in the past that my, my, mm -hmm. uh, my recent forays into being a content marketer. Um, you know, it's like five ways to make your, you know. You I know. was just about to do a parody of that and say seven amazing skills you can build to may improve your, your podcast. Yeah. yeah. No, no, to triple your podcast audience. How about that? that? It has to be, yeah, it has to be it's gotta It's got to have like a numeric payoff. Oh, by the way, there's a website and, um, shoot, it's not HubSpot. I will find it and put it in here in a second where you literally like they, you type in the headline for your post and they AI it. They say it's not enough emotional words. There's, and they, yeah, it's sweet. It's, it's like a, it's like a comprehension level thing only for SEO. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. I will, I will drop that in here in a second. Love that. Or call, you know, write Kevin and say, Kevin, what's the link for that? Yeah, exactly. I used it all the time. It's hysterical, but it, it is oh. how you end up having the buzzfeedification of the entire internet. There's pluses and minuses to it, but yeah. Exactly. So in the chat, I just typed in a, a, a mystical looking topic of IJB as a reminder to me that something I've been toying with doing for a couple of years now is to, to do a vlog, basically a podcast with video called Inside Jerry's Brain. Yes. And to do it with my brain as the backdrop. And, and I'm, I'm sort of not quite sure how to do this technically other than sort of screen share my brain, but I kind of don't want just the brain to be there. I want there to be lots of talking heads and all that. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, how to mix it up. But to do something a lot like, like the Yitan podcast was, which is lots of different topics, in fact, kind of improv style. Um, and then to both um, mine the brain, to look for what do I already have on these topics, but then to add things live to the brain, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I keep toying with it. It would, take, it would take some focus to do and some attention and some time, but it, I think it would be really fun to do. And I think for the longest time I, I didn't undertake it because when I'm using zoom and using my brain and the browser a little bit, things slow down on my computer and it's not that pleasant, but I yeah. think, I think maybe things are sort of quick enough now that it, it might actually work. But if that sounds like a terrible idea, like raise your hand or tell me, but if it sounds like a, like something I should go try to do, let me know too. Well, it's interesting. Oh, there's the link, the headline analyzer. Thank you. Yeah. It's hysterical. It's really funny. Um, it's so funny. I lost a little bit. I'm, I'm now going to be honest and trust. I lost a little bit of your goal while I was looking for the headline analyzer. Mm -hmm. So what's the issue? Um, should, I do a, should I do a vlog, a video show called Inside Jerry's Brain? And you know what? I could pretty easily and cheaply try it out for three months. I could say, hey, I'm going to do it for this long and see what happens. Right. It is really unique. That's the thing that I, my, with my marketer hat on, that's the thing I really like about it. It's interesting yeah. and different. And I just, I just only this moment realized why this matters in this conversation. Okay. Which is, um, someone pointed out, Alisa, was it you? Someone else. I'm trying to figure out how to open up interesting conversations around trust. Right. Nobody knows me. And the question is, how do I establish trust up front? And one thing that's really interesting about inside Jerry's brain is that it's an act of vulnerability. Like you are in fact inside everything I think. You can, you can see what I believe. You yeah. can see you know, all, you know, the evidence I've collected for a long time. It's all kind of right there. You are, you are it's a little bit like inside you know, being John Malkovich. Uh, you know, it's like Malkovich, Malkovich, Malkovich. No, I think you should call it being Jerry's brain. <laughs> If, or something like that. It might, we yeah. might play around with the, if you want to play across, you know, I can do my branding stuff. With well, you. 
And then a conversation I just had last night over, over tacos um, was very much about getting people's confidence in a way, and this was more of a sales tactic than anything, but I like it. Make it about them, not about you. So inside Jerry's brain winds up being about Jerry, about me. And, and the Jerry's brain object is this kind of unique thing in the world that I don't understand. You know, I think it's all, like pretty interesting, but who knows? So how do I frame it so that I'm doing that thing, but it's not so much about me, but about everybody else right. coming in? To think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the idea of calling it being Jerry's brain or inside Jerry's brain, I, I find it tongue in cheek. I like it. I find it amusing, but it is definitely like putting me front and center, which I don't usually do. Right. Um, what else, how else might it be framed? But, yeah. but, but I like the angle that trying to host a, an earnest conversation about trust, which is what we're doing right now, like this design from trust video set that I'm putting up on YouTube is exactly that. It's like, hey, let's sit down and have an earnest conversation about trust is, is what it is. Mm -hmm. Might that other vehicle be a really good way for opening up very similar issues, but from a place of more credibility and because of the vulnerability? And, and, or, or am I reading too much into the, that kind of context? Um, what I'm thinking, I have, I'm going to ruminate on this because it's not an easy answer. Um, and I think there's, there's, a, there's definitely something that can be done around this. I'm questioning whether whatever we come up with should be a vlog. You mean no video or no what? Or what do you mean? No, it should be a series of video. I mean. By vlog, what I mean is a video series. Okay. So just screen captures on topics. Okay, good. I want to make sure that it's not. Yeah, I'm curious what do we all think vlog, vlog, vlogs are. To me, it's a podcast that includes video. It's uh, it. I, yes. No? Well, I'm, so what I'm doing is I'm questioning whether it needs to be a live thing and you just make a series of videos that are interesting to watch. Oh, so you're saying. Topics of your brain. And because, you know, with being a true friend here, like you've got this great thing designed from trust. Yeah. I would spend more energy building that up and having the video series be a thing that's a, a yeah. of quality. Okay. And I think you have a lot of interesting, to me, it's, a, it's it, and I haven't been in your brain in a while, but it shows longevity. It sh I know, sorry. It shows longevity. It shows quals. It's an interesting tool. Like it establishes you in a lot of interesting ways. Yeah. I think spending some time, and I could probably think through this with you, is like, um, an open, like I interviewed Jerry recently for a company that I was with and just left and that video never made it up. That's, and I feel bad about that, but I do have it somewhere just so you know. But my point is that what I've learned uh, over the last two years of doing a lot more videos is use that as a really interesting, unique, like let's come up with a, a, mm -hmm. a, a framework and a structure for a series of those and just throw those up on YouTube and Facebook. Interesting. Uh the, the thing that lit this idea back up in my head, because I've been thinking about Inside Jerry's Brain for a couple of years now, yeah. the thing that really brought it back to the fore was uh, two weekends ago, there was a conference, weirdly, in the building that I'm sitting in. So I have a, I have a, a desk at a little design firm in Portland called Ziba Design. Mm -hmm. And four weeks ago, I got a note from Gary Wolf, the guy who kind of started the quantified self movement. Right. I knew that name was familiar. <laughs> yeah. And so Gary's like, hey, you're in Portland, right? We're going to have our next quantified self-conference is actually going to be in your town in the Ziva Auditorium. And I write him back and I'm like, guess where I'm sitting? Um, and so they had the conference here and, and Gary gave me 15 minutes at the very end of the conference. So Sunday at 5 p.m. Esther, by the way, was at the whole conference. She was great. Wow. Because um, Esther cares about the topic a lot. Yeah. Um, Esther Dyson, the person I used to work for, Lisa. Um, and... So in those 15 minutes, I basically, um, thank you, Elisa. Uh, I'm sorry we're going over too. I'm going to, no I'm going to wrap the call pretty soon. Um, sorry about that. That's all right. And so I stood up and I basically showed my brain to this room of quantified self people because it is that's a form of QS, it's right? Totally Q. It, it's the original QS. And it kind of blew everybody's mind. Yeah. Like I could see the fuses popping. The Q and A was fantastic. They really got it and cared. Um, I, there were a couple of really funny moments uh, in it. Uh, the video is actually going to be put up at some point pretty soon. They, they, they videoed everything. And I'm, I'm hoping they also videotape what I was showing because mostly okay. I'm, I think they're going to fold in the decks. And I didn't have a deck. I was doing a live frame <laughs> demo. Yeah. But that made that, and I've done improv style uh, brain live sessions before. I did one at the, what was it called? The, in Berkeley, the Hill House? No, what was the? 
What was oh, the name yeah. of the place that Jeff U. Boys was a member of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hillside Club. Hillside Club. Hillside right. Club. So I did one at the Hillside Club. I did one somewhere else. Um, and I love them because that, like, like the humans together looking at knowledge and gardening together, Jack will, Jack will empathize with this a lot. Yeah. Is exciting. Yes, you're right. You're right. And, you're right. and if everybody's leaning into it, you're like, mm, 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 mm. That was cool. I want more of this. How do I do that? So, so the liveness of it captures that. And, and, and one thing I know about me is anytime I start recording a video, I slip into yes. so deliberate Jerry mode and I lose all of the fire that's there when I'm in front of a group. I, I have the same issue. So I totally get that. I'm totally getting what you're saying. I think what I'm responding to is um, maybe, do, maybe do fewer this mm -hmm. is where I always go big, right? Mm -hmm. Do spend some time to craft what this live session, the first one will be. Right. Maybe do a, do a test one, you know, a pilot and a little MVP, for MVP first. But I would like to do like one big one that goes, that that's really captures it well, rather than a lot of small series of. Uh, and, I, and I can do both things. I can uh, record yeah. and post. I can have yeah. live scheduled shows and I can say this one's live. Here's, here's one that I did, you know, offline. Well, that, that's fine. Yeah, and think of ways to like bring it into this topic or not. Or Yeah, there's definitely something something there. And I think it's crafting the, the story. Exactly. And in how to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Topic Quests, any, any thoughts on this? Um, no, this is Topic Quests. That's the whole point. You guys are knowledge, knowledge gardener garden. all the way this is this is knowledge gardening at its best no question about it that feels good yeah 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 so got to find the other knowledge gardeners and come in together and sort of do this thing yeah that's right yeah. cool yeah good okay that motivates me to, to just at least I, I can give this a try at zero marginal cost so it's it's basically you know the effort to get to, to do it frame it and get get the word out i do own inside jerry'sbrain.com I, I don't have being jerry'sbrain.com, but hey, those I have, I'm it, pretty I, sure. I, once I said it, it was like, nah, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's, it, when you said it, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate enough with the movie that it would, it, it doesn't work. Well, being Jerry. Being be Jerry, fun. right, yeah. Which, which I don't want, I don't, which I don't recommend to anybody. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, but, any last thoughts on this topic before we wrap the call? Um, just that I want to catch up with you. Oh. One-on-one, -on -one, for sure. Let me make an introduction. Marc-Antoine Perron has just joined. Oh program. my God, I'm just in time. Um, and Sorry. Jerry, I, I asked you to make sure he's on the list. Um, he, he, he is a knowledge gardener supreme and he's in Montreal. Fabulous. Bienvenue. Nice to meet you all. And, and he, de he deserves to be invited to a retreat sometime. Sounds excellent. Whenever we do one again, right? Well, I do know. one in Montreal and you'd guarantee he'd be there, but. <laughs> oh, man, I've totally got to do one. That'd be a great place to do one, that. Uh, it is a great place. Yeah. And Marc-Antoine, you, you're, you're in the Topic Quests uh, venture or how do you connect to, to these sorts of issues? I'm um, very much part of the Topic Quest venture. I'm also doing my own things. What I'm, fo I'm focusing on two things in a way. Uh, mostly uh, interoperability layer for uh, knowledge applications. So protocols, so knowledge applications can share data. Uh, yes. That what sounds a, great. This yes. means I agree. And this means I disagree. Okay, good. And uh, then uh, I, when that is ready, I'll be able to get more in, in, involved in actually visualizing conceptual structures and you know, trying to find how to make clear what the salient points are, especially in terms of community agreement, disagreement. Yeah. And, uh, you know, showing the points of consensus and dissensus on a graph. Are you familiar with Stephen Tolman's argumentation theory? Very much. Yeah. Um, I'm so, sorry, go ahead. Um, I like it a lot conceptually. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's what I would use as a graph structure. Right. If you, what I mean, I, like, I don't think visualizing that is that helpful. Um, but certainly 
the notion of grounding is essential. Uh, the notion of, and we need to show where a concept or uh, an assertion is grounded. Yes. Not as a link, but as a domain. And uh, so there's, a, there's another one of our trust conversations, this whole point of argumentation. Um, so one of, one of my... Um, yeah, I was interrupting, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Um, one of my... Sorry, I need to... I accidentally didn't type it in the right place. One of my realizations from 20, almost 21 years of using the brain now is that we are an amnesic civilization. We are dumber than we otherwise would be because we don't have tools for sharing what we know. Right. And, and that leads directly to the question you were just raising, which is, hey, if we were actually sharing what we know, what would it look like? And, and, and what is a compelling way to do that, right? right? And that, you get into really deep waters really quickly because oh, yes. um, I had a Zoom call with two other black belt brain users a year ago there are other black belt. There are other brain users. It's true. All twelve of us, or something. I don't know. There's the, you like, guys like, have an annual retreat. And if we all are in the same place at the same time, we have to buy extra insurance, right? <laughs> uh, Climate Web is uh, a brain. It, it, well, Mark was one of the people on the call, um, yep. and then the other person on the call uses the brain in such an intricate way that I could not understand what he was doing. You I, I actually, I actually, yeah. like, I, I, I had to shrug and give up. I was like. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like the way he was using the same tool to represent stuff, I would have done completely and totally differently. So, so that was within the same tool. Then you go over to Kumu and you go over to, you know, there's, there's, there's 15 odd actually pretty good tools, each of which have very different representational mechanisms, some of which are really complicated to look at. And your average civilian coming through is not going to get what's happening there, right? So, so I, I think this is a hugely important question. Like, like, what does this visualization look like and how is it understandable so that it might be used in civic discourse at a town hall meeting anywhere in the world, yes. right? Because that's one of the important places where, where this might actually help us. Um, and Marc-Antoine, uh, just before you joined, I was describing a, a video show I think I want to prototype called Inside Jerry's Brain which would basically be like an improv session with my brain as a backdrop, shared screen kind of thing, but I'd like to be, make it a little bit more interesting than that, um, where we use um, a, a curated context as a, a, a prop and a background for the conversation. And what you're looking at doing shines a light on that as a, as a like, yes, that, that's part of why I would like to experiment this way. Good. No, cl clearly there's, the visualization is a huge thing. I've started thinking about it, but I'm, as I said, I'm more busy with the protocol right now, which is huge. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a huge kettle of fish, but it's obvious to me that we have to make it very clear uh, the intersection between thoughts and community. Uh, what is the, where, where has, in which community has this thought arisen, which community supports it, which community um, disputes it, why? And also I keep speaking about weak signals, uh, make it very clear, oh, look, this has been proposed, there's been an objection, nobody's answered that objection. So the proposal is in trouble until somebody has an answer. Maybe the answer will have an answer, and you know this is. But these are. This is more IBIS based. Uh, but having computational values and IBIS knowing composite computational va value, how many people is it? Always the same troll making all the objections. Is it? What's the support for this objection? Uh, these are the kinds of things that must be visible. Exactly. Uh, one side note in here, which is one of the things that's really important for me to preserve in a shared context, sort of collaborative sense-making tool, is the ability for me to have my own point of view visible. And then, and then for us to figure out what are our overlaps, where are our common interests, all of that. And if I had to, like on Wikipedia, there's only one canonical page for like the Jack Park page, and we all have to debate and agree on what goes on the Jack Park page. 
I could not do that. If I had to debate what each entry does, I, I would not use the tool, period. So mm -hmm. my ability to, to, to curate my brain, I love that and it's worked really well for me, but if, and I want to share it, but I then have to be able to see these intersections, that they're, they're as important as anything else to me. The, the, the absolutely true. One thing I'm trying to make clear in the protocol is beyond uh, transclusion, it's I'm using very much a GitHub model. Mm -hmm. The cool. notion that here's a base we agree on or this community agrees on, and then I can make a fork and, okay, here's how I view things. The community agrees, okay, good, let's merge. <laughs> uh, That's great. Um, and a, a very tiny thing, um, are you looking at, and this, this is out of, outside of the realm of protocols, but it's about how the data is stored. Are you looking at distributed um, storage of the data so that basically tuples are, are savable and retrievable from any server on the web? Yes, the, yes and no, uh, but yes, definitely. I'm working on the notion of what I call a, you know, a realm container or whatever. I call it a realm right now. And this realm is both a storage container and a community reference point, right? So of course I can create my own realm based on a given realm and then I can store it myself. I can put it in distributed storage. I can do all kinds of things. I'm a lot of that, some of that is in the future, but what is in the present right now is the notion that you refer to uh, the, the, the big issue is identifiers, right? So basically any topic has a AKA field mm -hmm. saying this is also known as this and this, in this ID, in this realm, in this ID, in this realm, in this ID, in this realm. Like a, like a thesaurus, but it has to have sort of fuzzy logic around it. It's, um, the AKE I see is not so uh, fuzzy. I can have other relationships for non-fuzzy things. Okay. And I can, the relations can just refer to something outside. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Super interesting, love it. Love it. Realize it's just us now. Yes. Ta-da. <laughs> uh, I, I need to tell you a short story. I, I first met Marc Antoine on a uh, uh, who's Mr. Wiki? What 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 what's his name? Ward Cunningham. Ward, Ward Cunningham uh, hangout. And eventually, I had, did some emails with Marc Antoine, and I told him that I was going to Dubrovnik to uh, to uh, uh, a uh, Knowledge Federation conference, and he said, "Oh, can I come?" And he did, mm -hmm. and he fit right in, and he actually ran some of the sessions, and, and so he's been, he's been one of us ever since. Mm, that's great, and he lives here in Portland. Yes, of course he does. Yes. He's a neighbor, I, I, but I've only had lunch with him once since being here, so I should probably catch up again. Yeah, I, I, would, I would drive to Portland just to spend time with him, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, he is, he's wonderful. Sweet. Um, we've been on this line for a long time. Uh, do you want to broach any other topics? And, and Mark Antoine, it feels like we've just barely opened the lid on where we can talk about things, but um, <laughs> shall we wrap this one and plan a different call? It's, it's you guys, it's your choice. I mean, it's fabulous that uh, what I did is I, I sent, I replied to your invite to today and copied uh, Mark Antoine to ask you to add him to the list and he picked up the URL and jumped in and uh, it's it, it perfect timing. Yes, yes. Strangely, just perfect. Black Swan actually. <laughs> and, and so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's one of us and he should be dragged to a retreat. Okay, we can do that. That's easy. Now I just have to have one. <laughs> well, yes, I, I understand. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, we uh, do need to organize something here as well someday because let's face it, it's convenient. Yeah. Well, we've had talks about doing what we call Dubrovnik West. And um, lots of people, even uh, Yuzuru Tanaka from, from Japan would like to come to a, mm. a, well, you know, you recall he went to Marconi with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking of doing a, a Dubrovnik West at Marconi as, as, as a, you know, in fact, I talked to you about that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I may have to hire you to run it for us. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's, um, but we need, we need a knowledge, we need an epistemic event. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, that's slightly different than the broad ranging, you know, the blue sky things that you run. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to have a major event where we bring people who think like you and I and Mark Antoine and, and so forth. It, that's that's going to be a big one and we need to do it. So as a closing note, perhaps there is a, let me see if it's a public thought. Uh, in my brain, there's a thought titled Viz Posse, which is sort of the visualization posse. It's, it's people I've heard of or met. Some of them I've met, a lot of them I've just heard of. Um, who care about this topic. And none of the people who are under this thought know that they're here. So this is just my own list as I wander around and make these connections. And Marc Antoine, I'm going to add you to my brain and add you to this thought like when we're done, but this would be my starting point for an invite list for who might be interested in these kinds of things. And it, this is less the knowledge ontological side than the how do we see what we know and share it side, but it's all inter intertwin deeply intertwinkled as, uh, as, Everything Ted, Nelson, is, as yes. Ted Nelson told us so long ago. Yes. Well, what a fantastic way to wind up a, a really good conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank I'm sorry that Mark and Twan missed the earlier parts because they related too, but. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, take the recording and post it on YouTube and send out a link. Uh, uh, Marc Antoine, do you want to be on the Design From Trust uh, mailing list, the conversational list? Yes. Great, I will put you on there and then I'll post the link to that list so um, I can get those things done right away. Okay. You have Thank you. my email, do you want a URL or? Uh, what is your email? If you'll type right. your email into the chat, um, yes. I will pick it up and. Well, it's also in the email I sent you. Oh, never mind then. Don't do, yeah, don't put it in the chat so just in I... case the chat goes public. Oh, there we go. I, I'm putting both because that, that's my oh. that's my company's that's not my personal that's my company's so that gives you the URL at the same time. <laughs> All right, that's a better one. Sure. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you, sir. Great fun. Really appreciate this. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.